So good, very good morning to you all, and you're very welcome to today's Signpost webinar. I hope you're keeping safe and well wherever you're joining us from today. My name is Mark Gibson, and I'm the manager of the Chagas Connected program. This series is brought to you by Chagas in collaboration with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, uh, Food Drink Ireland Skillnet, and the National Rural Network. Organic farming in Ireland can be considered somewhat of a marginal sport with only 2% of Ireland's land cover under organic production. However, that may be about to change with ambitious targets set out under the new European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Elaine Levy, organic specialist with Chagas, to tell us more about organics in Ireland and some of the practical issues for farmers. Elaine, you're very welcome to our webinar this morning. How are you today? Good morning. Not so bad, Mark. Good morning to everybody. Uh, I'm, ringing, I'm ringing in from a, a frosty Midlands this Frost. morning. Yeah, it's not too bad here in the West this morning, but I believe the, the next uh, few days are going to be getting quite cold. And I, I know the kids are expecting a bit of snow this direction yes. as well. So the fingers are crossed this side. Pat, good morning to you. How are you today? Good morning. Great. Not a bother. So, uh, well locked down here in the southeast. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, I see Wexford is in, in the news for all of the, the wrong reasons yeah. this morning, but um, um, hopefully things improve there. Okay, and a bit of sleet outside just to add to the misery. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Pat, you're our environment, uh, head of our environment knowledge transfer program, so you'll be helping us with questions later on. Lane, before we start, maybe you could just give us a little bit of background to the work that you're doing within Chagas as organic specialist. Yes, Mark. Well, I suppose if I was to describe the purpose of my job, it is to uh, support conversion uh, to organic production and to increase the knowledge base of prospective organic producers and producers that are in the area. And the way I go about doing this on a day to day basis is um, I'm one of two that's working permanently on organic, myself and my colleague Dan Clavin. And between the two of us, we support our local Chagas advisors that are on the ground and are, who in turn are supporting their clients. Uh, we provide training in the area of organics. We deliver uh, the QQI Organic Farming Principles course, which is a requirement for people uh, applying to join the organic farming scheme. We also do various collaborations with the other stakeholders in the, in the area, one such collaboration would be with the Department of Agriculture. We have an organic demonstration farm network program. So it's all about developing and promoting organic farming and whatever else comes along the way in relation to organics to, to get it, that information out there. Right. And you work with a network of advisors across the country, is that right, that are, they, they have a specialism in organic production? Yeah, what we have in each uh, area unit, we have a contact uh, our, uh, contact advisor there it's they're doing the, all their other day-to-day -day work as well but uh, if anybody calls in or is a uh, query into relation to on organics they would be their first point of contact and then we're there to support support them as necessary great great okay lane if you'd like to share your screen with us and uh, you can go through your your presentation uh, for we normally presentations last about half past half an hour uh, so if um, any of our audience would like to ask questions, um, please do use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we'll endeavour to get through as many of your questions at the end of Elaine's presentation. So Elaine, I'll hand over to you now, and uh, we will have your slides. Uh, yes, certainly. Are we okay there, Mark? Yeah, that looks great. Okay, thank you. Well, just again, just to say, just for those of you who joined, good morning, everybody. And what I'm going to endeavour to talk to you about today and give you an overview is the title is Steps to On-Farm Conversion and Opportunities. It's not moving, Mark. Um, Mark? Uh, yes. It's my... my um, no, I must... You're clicking on the slide, it's not moving on, is it? Um, if, you, if you maybe close out of it again and, and open, open it up again. Not a great start. Ah. Um, let's see. Okay. It happens. It happens, a minor detail, I'm sure. <laughs> Sorry. 
sorry, Mark would have talked me through this because now I'm, I'm pressing a load of buttons here and I want to freeze everything up, I think. Let me see. And uh, now I think it's this one. Yes, share. Um, now, okay, here goes. Yes, okay. Ready? Rewind, yeah. start again. Okay, great. okay, everybody. As I was saying, what I hope to talk to you about and give you an overview, and it's from my own, I suppose, uh, experience and and experiences on a day to day basis. And I've been working in organics full time for the past thirteen years. So what I'm going to talk to you about is I'm going to talk to you about what actually is organic agriculture, what is the organic production in Ireland, uh, what opportunities are there. If anybody is uh, maybe thinking about in the audience that is thinking about converting to organics or even people that are not in, in, in that situation, but give people an overview as regards what are the steps involved when converting to organic conversion. And then also maybe to do a little crystal ball gazing and see what does the future hold in organics. Usually when I uh, give talks to groups, I always maybe start as an icebreaker uh, asking people, what is organic farming to them? What do they think when somebody says organic agriculture? I'm not going to do it this morning, but it's a good icebreaker to just get people thinking. And it's a good way maybe to start this, this talk this morning. What I've put here that you see in front of you is a definition uh, def from the, where I sourced it from was from the International Federation of Organic Agricultural Movements. And they're an umbrella organization for all uh, uh, organic organizations in Europe and indeed in the world. And they put together this definition, which in turn, uh, from which the principles for organic farming have been taken from. Now I've just, if you look at it there, I'm not going to read it, but just I've highlighted some of the words there. You have here uh, so health of soils, ecosystems and people. So when we're talking about agriculture and the principles of agriculture, you start from the soil where, where it all begins and you go right through the whole process, right to the people that are producing and ultimately eating it. It relies on, we have words here, ecological processes, diet biodiversity and cycles adapted to local conditions. We all know in the last 18 months, biodiversity is, has come to the fore in relation to European policy and farming practices going forward. Another words here, the last paragraph, it combines tradition, innovation and science. So some farmers, when they ring talking about organics, they say, well, uh, some of the methods that are in, in our practices that are in organics are traditional, they've been done for generations, which is true. But also it's worth remembering and noting that there is innovation and there's a lot of innovation going on on organic farms, on organic farming practices, and there is science behind it. Also, ultimately, the whole organic ethos is to promote a fair relationship and a good quality of life for all involved. All involved. So it takes account the, from the person that's, let's say, sowing the seed to eating the crop, that it takes that all that's involved in the process, that there is fair relationship among all involved. Also, it is worth this one, it is um, in relation to the organic movement. I suppose the organic movement in Europe really took hold and really um, gained, I suppose, momentum in the second half of the 21st century when industrial farming became with the mechanization and industrialization of, of farming. And then, then about that time, there was a lot of pioneers and a lot of associations in, in, like, in organics and organizations like, like what I've just mentioned there, IFOM, and they all started building momentum and they started to put pressure on government for regulation to be put in place. And in 1991, EU regulation was put in place for organic production by the EU Council. So a framework was put in place as regards organic production. And I suppose what the regulation does, just to, to pinpoint it, it deals with three areas. It, it, it uh, creates a framework for, uh, it defines organic production methods for crops and for, uh, for livestock. It also regulates the labeling, the processing, the packaging and inspection of organic products in Europe. And also deals with, regulates the importation of other organic products from other countries outside of the EU. 
So that was defined and regulation was put in place in EU Council in 1991. Each country has a competent authority to ensure that this regulation is adhered to. And in Ireland, the competent authority to ensure the regulation is all adhered to by all those registered uh, farming organically or processing, etc. is the Department of Agriculture based in um, the organic unit based in Johnstown Castle in Wexford. That's just to set the tone. What I'd like to go on to now is to actually look, and Mark just mentioned some of it in the, in the introduction to it, is to look at what is the organic production in Ireland? What, where, where do we stand? In relation to the area of land being produced, that is producing organic production in Ireland is at 2% presently. That would equate to about 74,000 hectares of land being farmed organically presently. If we were to compare that with the, U, in, in the average in Europe, the average in Europe stands at the moment at about 7.5% of the agricultural area, which would equate to about 13.4 million hectares of land. And I just looked there globally, just to, maybe just to mention here that globally, um, presently in the 2018 figures, there was uh, 58 million hectares being managed organically worldwide. So that's to give you the whole sphere right across. Mark mentioned there in the introduction, uh, as regards, again, in, we have had under the EU Green Deal, we've had from the farm to fork strategy uh, being announced for, you, for Europe that's going to take place in the coming years. As regards, negotiations are only starting in each country, but in in that, uh, in that strategy document, there is um, a target that by 2030, 25% of the EU uh, agricultural land will be farmed organically. So as, as outlined by um, Mark, an ambitious target has been set in place. Just... Turning our attention to what is the actual, we've, we've said what the area is, but what is the breakdown of production in organics in, in Ireland? And I'm showing you a slide here. And on this slide is a graph. And on the bottom, bottom line of the graph, it outlines the various enterprise types. And then on the vertical the one, vertical, if I'm right, standing up, I'd say, is the actual number of farmers. And if we just take a look at it and, and go through it, a 1,384 uh, organic cattle in our farms have cattle in it. Seven over 700 have sheep. 240 horticulture production. There's 134 uh, farmers with organic cereals. 172 as regards organic poultry, and 62 uh, organic dairy farms. When you take a look at it, I suppose the first thing that would would strike you is that. The sector, most of the sector is made up of dry stock farms. So that is the biggest sector within the, within the production sector of the, of the system. I will maybe just add that the numbers have increased in, since, uh, since 2015. Uh, there's been a 40% increase in the numbers. So the numbers have increased. Maybe just to add also that where are these farmers located as regards on a county basis? And maybe just if you might hear a county being shouted out now, 50% of uh, the organic farmers are located in six counties. And those are, I have to remember them, those are Cork, Roscommon, Galway, Tipperary, Limerick and Leitrim in the last figures that we've got. So that gives you an idea of, of the, the production. So when we talk about organics, we need to talk about um, opportunities and what is the organic sector, what opportunities and what we talk about, for example, we know from research that uh, organic uh, farming has a more benign effect on the environment compared to, to conventional farming. In organic farming, you're not allowed to use any nitrogen or agrochemicals. And in the strategies going forward, EU want to see a reduction in that, in the, in the whole use of uh, fertilizers and um, chemicals. Also, organic production can lead to a greater biodiversity on farms. And what this would be due to, you would see on a, on a farm level, would be due to crop, uh, crop rotation and lower input use. 
Also, animal welfare um, considerations. We all know animal welfare considerations are also coming to the forefront in relation to and becoming more relevant on farming. In organic farming, in organic, uh, in organic animal production, animal welfare is a core principle in, of paramount importance in the whole system. And there are strict regulations and farmers are using more, um, are, for example, to give you a practical example, in the whole area of animal housing, uh, bigger space requirements are needed by animals and all animals have to have an access to a lie back area. If we look at, again, it's a market, what kind of a market for organic food? Uh, organic food, there is an increased demand for organic food. If we take it from a global level, the market value at global level in 2018 was at 97 billion. It's projected to reach in the region of 187 billion by 2024. If we step down and look at the European uh, market, the, again, worth in the region of 37.4 billion in 2018 and is expected to double in 2024. So again, in Ireland, if we step down again, in Ireland, um, figures from Board B in 2018, the organic market was worth 250 million and, and also growing. So again, from clicking this in with aligning this with the EU, the EU wants, uh, wants to invest in growing the demand for organic food. So the, the, the opportunity is there. If we look at farmer lifestyle, it, uh, lifestyle choice, and from my own experience uh, day to day, farmers are looking at, uh, at their farms, maybe I suppose with new eyes, and they're looking at, they really do see organic as an option for diversifying on the farms. And I was involved uh, with a project lately and we had to interview farmers as regards what was important aspect of their farming systems. And they had to list five points and we discussed them. And in a number of the organic farms that I interviewed, uh, lifestyle was, uh, was important to them. They see, some see organic farming as a way uh, of cutting back on inputs while still returning a good income and having a lifestyle that suits them. Important also to look at the whole area of rural viability. It's another area in rural development that we are, are, are talking about and having communication with everybody that is involved. Organics, yes, it can be profitable, of course, the simple answer, and I'll talk a little bit more later about that. But an example to increase rural viability that I would come as a, an organic exa example would be horticulture farms. I have come across a number of hort organic horticulture farms. They are small areas. Sometimes as farmers, we get obsessed that the more area you have, the more you can produce. But what always strikes me with uh, organic horticulture uh, producers is what they can do on a small acreage of land and what, they, what, what margins they can achieve and markets to get. And in doing this and, and creating a profit, they also in turn create employment, which also will increase and help the economic of the rural, of rural areas and of rural viability. So that's kind of the, a big picture overview of it. Uh, I just want to just take a look at what I do a, a lot when I'm talking to people and a lot of inquiries we get as regards, okay, how do I go about getting into organs or what's involved? So myself and, my, and Dan have put together steps to organic conversion. So I want to go through with you as regards, if a, if a farmer is deciding to convert to organics, what do they need to do or what do they need to think about? So it's um, step one, it's like the safe cross code with a different step one, you have to consider. So you really need to think about it. And these are the, let's say if you're coming from producing crops, what kind of questions do you have to ask yourself? What do you have to consider? And first of all, one thing you need to look at is, can you incorporate a grass clover break in the rotation? If you go out to any organic farmer, and go to any talks or walks, you will always hear clover being mentioned because clover in the overall uh, organic production system is seen as a cornerstone for production because 
it is helping your fertility building in organics and it's providing the tools to grow crops. So that's, you have to think about doing that because in organics, when you think about it, you can't, conventionally you can go crop year in, year out with the same crop. This, that's not in the case in, in organic crop systems. Then you have to think about how you're going to feed the crop, what kind of source of on-farm nutrients you have, what amount you have, what value are they are. So nutrient management is very important. Yes, you can buy in a prohibited uh, peas and Ks that are allowed under organic systems, but you want to make the best use of what you, you have on the farm and reduce the, the need for any off-farm inputs. A very simple question. Uh, can you see, if it's a simple question, it might be very evident here because when I, when people and most people know that when you're farming organically, you can't, you can't use pesticides and chemical fertilizers. But I think it's very important to actually say that out loud to yourself when you're considering organics. Can you do it? You really have to ask yourself, can you do this, uh, produce this without, without pesticides and chemical fertilizers? If we move on then in a livestock system, what kind of questions, what do you need to be considering? First of all, in relation to the stocking rate in organics, if the stocking rate, uh, you cannot exceed the 170 kgs of organic nitrogen per hectare. So what stocking rate you have? Now, some people, when they're thinking about uh, converting to organics, they think, oh, am I going to have to reduce my stock? How much am I going to reduce? use my stock by. I would have come across circumstances where, yes, people will, will reduce their stocking rate, but I have had people that have reduced their stocking rate and then went when they got into the system, were able to bring back their stock numbers again. So again, it's, it's uh, depending on your situation, etc. The whole, we, we said about, I mentioned under animal welfare in organics is, 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 a, is paramount and you have to look at housing. And if you're, if you're housing animals, uh, modifications may be needed because you have to have a, a, a bedded lying back area for your animals. Again, no more than the crop. You have to ask yourself, uh, do you already use no or relatively low levels of artificial fertilizer? A common comment that I would get with people uh, thinking about converting is, I sure I don't use any much fertilizer anyway, but you have to say, can I do this without using any fertilizer? Profitability. Again, organics is no different than any other system. Is there profit in it? I suppose just a dramatic pause there. Apologies, just catching my breath. Um, is it profitable? The simple answer, yes, it is profitable, but it's not just as simple as that in practice. There's a lot of things that you need, there are components and factors that you have to look at in putting it all together in, in relation to profitability. The first thing is, I would say, land quality. Land quality is going to determine a lot, what you're standing on, what it's capable of doing, what it's capable of producing, what stocking rate it's able to carry. So that will depend. And like in Ireland, it's amazing. It's a comment that comes up. You could be in the one farm and you could have different types of land quality. So again, you, you see what your quality of your land is. Management and skills is important. And I, I would say that uh, um, quite simply, there's no quick fix solutions in, 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 in organics. You have to do, there's a lot of farming practices uh, that are put in place that are extra to combat. For example, weed control in, our, in organics, you're looking at methods such as maybe false stale seed beds. I have a picture there, you see that um, weeder there, a thyme weeder. Um, so there's mechanical weeding. So there's different, there's different skills that's needed. There's different skills in the whole area of planning your crops, uh, rotations, etc. So that that's important to, to know. But again, it's nothing to, to uh, shy away from. Uh, Again, it's it's go for it and and learn. I suppose, like everybody else, is no different. You learn from your mistakes, but it's not un insurmountable. Again, uh, the next point I'd look at is access to markets. You have to be able to market it, and I'll say a little bit, bit more about markets in a couple of steps on. So you have to see why, where is your market. Uh, assessing uh, accessing scheme supports, and I'll also mention that in in a few minutes as regards what scheme support, that's important. And I presume 
very important is your, your, your attitude. You know, it's very, very important. Um, I brought a group of European visitors a couple of years ago to a number of organic um, farms throughout the country. And part of it, you have to do an evaluation feedback. And one of the comments that I got from a big majority of the group was how positive the attitude they, that the, the organic farmers had. So that's not saying that they're the only ones that have a positive attitude, but you'd need to have a positive attitude. And I would find when, when organic farmers are, are talking to groups um, that if they make, if something doesn't work, it doesn't work, you have to just get up and try it again. So it's important as well to have the, have the right attitude. Number two then is to actually, we could talk about organics all day, but actually to seed and practice is the best way. So to investigate. Um, again, the environment that we're in at the moment is not going to make that possible for our, our number one there. We, I have attended farm walks. Chagas in conjunction with the Department, of the Department of Agriculture have had an organic demonstration farm walk program for the last number of years. And it's, exactly what it is at farm walks that it's open to everybody not just farmers farmers the general public anybody to come to a farm walk they're they're usually delivered uh, right through the year and all the farm sectors are represented so that's a great way to see on farm practices and maybe dispel some of the myths from the reality also very important we talked about a regulation there is regulation in place it's you need to familiarize yourself with the organic regulations and standards. It's very, very important. You need to know uh, the, the you need to know the standards and the regulations that you have to adhere to, and they can be found in the organic food and farming standards. Um, also, talk to other organic farmers. Uh, again, uh, might sound obvious, but I suppose sometimes we're reluctant to ask people, so it's very important to talk to organic to 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 organic farmers. I would have an example where um, somebody was interested in, in organic farming, and there was only a, 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 somebody farming 15, 20 minutes away, and they didn't know that the other person existed. So it's important to to talk to organic farmers. And very important, we need to talk about the market and what. Asset, uh, assess the market. So what are they, if we look at it, what are the options for farmers uh, to sell their organic produce? I have the processors listed here. There are processors that are for all the main products of beef, beef, lamb, milk, and cereal. So there are processors for those, for those organic products. So that may be the route that you want to go. Some people will look at the whole area of direct sales direct to the customer, it takes, it is more work, but some people enjoy doing, doing that. I, I, and an example of that would be from the horticulture point of view, where you have people doing box schemes, uh, selling into supermarkets. Um, I even have a farmer recently who's gone down uh, to uh, market via online sales, their lamb. So again, some people just love the buzz of selling. Some of us, some of us may be just quite happy to sell four legs out the gate. So it depends on what you want from it and it depends on your time, etc. You can also sell to other organic farmers and down through the years, I have seen where some organic farmers, maybe weanling producers are producing weanlings. They're not carrying them any further and they've linked in with a beef finisher. So the beef finisher is coming and buying their cattle on an annual basis. So it's farming trade to trade, to trade farming. Also, um, the um, organic certification bodies on their websites have uh, classified sections where people can buy and sell uh, produce. Also, uh, there are a number of organic marts uh, that are designated for our, our, our organic sales. One such one would be, uh, I've come across, maybe Drumshambo, uh, Kilmallock, to name two of them. The whole area of farmer-led organized groups and what I mean by here is a group coming together and putting together a produce and selling it themselves. Uh, one such um, example I have of that is the Little Milk Company. They're a group or so of a dozen uh, organic dairy farmers and they have come together and they are producing their own cheese range. So that's an idea of what the options are as regards the market. 
So I was to move on then in relation to, um, I said that the competent authority in the competent authority for um, organics in Ireland is the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. And they're based in Johnstown uh, Castle. Now, the EU have allowed the EU legislation allows member states to use private inspection bodies uh, to carry out the inspection uh, and licensing system of organic operators to a private body. And the Department of Agriculture, the organic unit here in Ireland, have approved sec private sector bodies known um, as, the, as these organic certification bodies. And two of these bodies for land use organic production is the Irish Organic Association and the Organic Trust. So every organic farmer, what they do, first of all, what they do is, as I said, they carry out a licensing and inspection uh, on all organic farms and processors. And in turn, then there is a cross reporting mechanism between themselves and the organic unit of the Department of Agriculture. So all organic farmers are registered organic farmers are registered with an organic certification body. Also, a uh, part of the requirement for the organic farming scheme is to complete a, an approved 25 hour uh, QQI course on organic production. Uh, ourselves in Chagas, we have been delivering these courses for the last number of years. Uh, they're, the organic farming principles module up until what has happened with our with pandemic, uh, we were doing those in, our, in local offices regionally and delivering them over 25 hours over four days. On what we have to do is like everybody else, we've had to rethink it. And we're in the process at the moment of uh, putting together the course for delivery online. And we hope to be starting these courses shortly. Anybody interested in finding out more about it, go to the, the website we have here on, on this slide. Okay, organic support schemes, what is available? Again, the, the organic support schemes are administered, administered by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. And the one I'm going to just re to focus in on is the organic farming scheme. In the autumn, uh, in late autumn of 2020, Minister Pippa Hackett, who is responsibility for organics, uh, in, uh, announced a five million scheme, a five million package for the reopening of the organic farming scheme. Uh, my understanding at the moment, I know we're now in January, uh, that this Minister Hackett will shortly be announcing a date for the reopening of the of the organic farming scheme. It's expected that this funding, uh, additional funding of 5 million will allow between four and 500 new entrants to the organic farming scheme. This may vary depending on, on land area, et cetera, but that's what will be expected in the upcoming scheme to be announced by Minister Hackett to open shortly. There is also under the TAMS, there's also an organic capital investment scheme. And this is a, a scheme, part of TAMS, but extra funding is available for extra equipment under for an organic operator. And then you have the development of the organic processing industry or farm scheme. Where And for more information on those, you can contact the organic unit of the Department of Agriculture. Okay, maybe just in relation to, as regards, um, you have to, you've done all this, what happens then? If I decided in the morning to convert my farm to organics, how long does it take? What's, what's involved? Just to give you an idea of the terminology. When a farm ent uh, enters organic, you, you undergo a con what's known as conversion period. And that's when the land undergoes conversion. And in a livestock based grass system, that means there's a, a, a conversion period of two years. So if your land goes under conversion for two years, and after that day, you've got what's called full symbol organic status. In an arable, or, in an arable and a horticulture, um, uh, in arable and a horticulture, this is two years also, but it's only the crops sown after my 20, after land 
has undergone 24, or 24 two month, sorry, 24 two year conversion that will, will receive full organic status when sold. So that's, that's important to, to note. Just before I go into the conversion, so that is kind of the steps that's involved. I suppose sometimes we've gone through the conversion process there. First of all, I know we talk about converting their land, but you need to convert yourself, I'd say, in ways I would say to people that you know what it is. You've given a proper thought, you've considered, you've investigated, so you have a good, you know, you have a good handle on what is, what is expected of you when you're farming uh, organically. The future. I have a question mark there. A few things I want to say in relation to the future. Um, in Ireland presently, there is a seven-year government strategy plan in place for the development of the organic food sector. And that uh, was, was put in place for, in 2019 to run to 2025. I thought just to say the overall objective of it is to develop um, a viable organic food sector in Ireland and to focus on the market. So it's it has set production targets for each of the main sectors. There's an implementation group in place that's made up of all the people and all the stakeholders were involved in the putting together of this. And this implementation group um, will, will, I suppose, monitor progress and meet regularly as regards how they, how they are progressing with the objectives set out in the, in the document. So it's a working document. In relation to CAP, we, I have here the prospect for future funding uh, for CAP looks positive. If you read, we've mentioned just to say it again, I suppose to reinforce it, if, they, if you are looking for more organic production to be put in place, then you would expect and hope aligning with that will be support for producers. So post, uh, in the new CAP, it would look very positive in relation to funding of organics. Market, as I said, as I mentioned, an area supplied market is forecasted to continue growing globally. Uh, we had, I mentioned the figures, which I can't remember now, and I'm not going to quote them just in case I'm incorrect. I gave the figures there earlier on as regards the expected growth in the, in the market. And, and Europe, again, wants to support this growth. So to try and summarize it, just a couple of points um, in relation to the whole area of organic farming, there is EU regulation, there's a legal framework there in place. Organic farming sector in Ireland, yes, is small, but it is growing. There are opportunities there in the future. It looks good. There, there, there are opportunities. I just went to from a practical side as regards there are a number of steps uh, in converting to organic farming that you need to, you know, approach it, approach it logically uh, in, in your approach in finding out about it. And ultimately, as we produce for a market, the organic market is forecasted to grow globally. So, Mark Shin Shin, thank you very much for everybody for, for listening. And thank you so much for that and uh, really good overview of the organic sector. If I could ask you to maybe stop sharing your screen there and we, we can uh, deal with some of the questions uh, that have plenty of questions that have come through here today. Um, and, and looks, I, I just want to compliment you and your colleagues for the, the work that you've been doing in this area, in particular the, the farm walks, I think are an excellent way for farmers to anybody who is interested in, in getting involved in organics. And I, I know you've had a few celebrity chefs at your uh, yes. walks over the, the years and sampling some of the, the yeah, yeah. organic produce as well. So the numbers are still very good. Like as I said, we're working. I'm in the program since 2007, and 13 years on, the numbers still come. So and like as you say, joke there about the celebrity chef, but we always try every year. We sit down and we do try to improve it, though. So we haven't stood still with it. We're always tweaking it, but. Of course, we've had no walks. 20, 2020 was the year for walks. Yes, indeed. Uh, the um, You mentioned about the or the markets for organic produce in Ireland, and I suppose it's a frustration for me when I go to the supermarket and I see all of this uh, organic produce, but a lot of it imported. Um, what what can we do? or, or is, Are there measures being put in place to try and 
try and display some of that imported food or is that generally just out of season type of produce that we see coming into the country? Yeah, I suppose maybe to put it into context, uh, yes, um, 70 percent, let's say from a fruit, organic fruit and veg point of view, 70 percent of the organic fruit, fruit and veg that we eat is imported. So there's a short supply there. There's not enough being produced. 70 uh, percent um, of all the organic food that is purchased is purchased through the, the supermarkets and discounters. Um, in relation to the beef, organic beef, most of it is uh, is being exported, and a large majority of it that it, the home market is supplied. It's that's the way the sector is. Certainly, um, from what I've just said there, saying that seventy percent of the fruit and veg, certainly there is openings there for people to market demand there for fruit and veg. And also in the whole area of dairying, there's a very small dairy pool there. Uh, again, we would have processors there uh, looking for organic dairying. But again, you need to talk to the processor. We're talking about a small sector, so you can't just land in and do it. You have to, it's step by step. And I think from my own opinion, working and looking at it, we need to, I suppose, get everybody involved to see how we can approach this. No one person, no one group is going to do it. So we need the, this, all the stakeholders, the processors, everybody, the certification bodies, board, be it, the department, us all, to get in there and see what can be done. But yes, certainly it can be frustrating. You talked about a 40% increase in organic production since 2015. What was the main driver for that, Elaine? Um, I suppose, if I'm to be honest about it, that would have been in 2015. And in that year, the organic farming scheme opened. And previously, every year up in that, from I had been working when the scheme was there, about a couple hundred would join. But in 2015, there was an unprecedented number of people decided to convert. So we had over 500 new entrants at that in that scheme. So people just went with it. Mm -hmm and just decided to convert. Like, and I assume there's listeners there wondering, right, like 500 is not very big, but for the sector that we're working in and where we're at and building, it was a large number of people to come in at the one time. Well, just uh, while we're talking about large numbers, just like to say that we have nearly 400 uh, viewers on today. But don't say that to me, Mark. That's the worst thing you could possibly say to me. Now, let me get to have 10, please. Then you can tell. A lot of interest in this subject area. And I just want to uh, welcome in particular our international viewers who uh, join us uh, from, from overseas. Pat, quite a uh, lot of interest coming through in the questions there. Yeah, a huge number of questions coming through. And some of them are quick fire and some of them are kind of more philosophical. I, I okay. might start with a, a few uh, quick fire ones. Uh, are the support solely for conversion by current farmers or the, are they available to new entrants to farmers? Wait, sorry, sorry. Um, are the Pat. supports solely for conversion of, uh, uh, by current farms or are they available to new entrants to farming? But they will be available once you are up and running as a farmer and have your herd number and all of that. Is that what they mean? Yeah, it's, I think it's so. It's open I to think everybody. It's just, yeah. It's open uh, to all farmers. Yeah, and... Uh, uh, um, a well, question. it is not open at the moment. We have to wait till it's announced, but yes. Okay, and, and uh, presumably then... Uh, the question that will new sheep and beef farmers be al al uh, allowed to, to join the organic farming scheme? So I presume there's no issue there. Well, it will depend. It will depend on the terms and conditions of the scheme. Uh, the scheme opened up in uh, 2018 for a short while, and in that in that people that applied for the scheme, there was a ranking and selection process put in place where all applications were ranked and selected and given points in, in depending on their farming system and in those in, in though in that uh, in that ranking and selection uh, there was priority were given to uh, dairy hort and cereals as they were seen as clear areas where there was a market demand okay uh, a quick another quick one are there supports for farmers in the conversion period yeah, that's the organic, the, what, what we just maybe, yes, when you know something yourself, you sometimes take it for granted, everybody else should know. When we said the organic farming scheme is a five-year scheme, an initial contract for five years, and when you enter conversion, 
there's a two year conversion in conversion payment. And uh, that was 260, that 220, around that. I'm not, I'm just, the figure's just gone for me, but it's a, a conversion payment of over 200 euros per hectare for year one and two. Then you, as I said, after two years, your farm has, has full organic status. And for year three, four and five, the payment was lower in the region of 170 euros per hectare. So that's how the scheme is, 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 is packaged. OK, a, a, each, number of, a number of questions uh, related to uh, p- possibly partially going into uh, organics. So do you need to uh, convert the whole farm or can you convert part of the farm? Part, again, it's a partial conversion is permitted, but however, you can't have the same species of animals on board. So I couldn't have a breed of Aberdeen Angus and a breed of limousines. I could have sheep or cattle and also in the whole area of cereal growing, different varieties and species of crops have to be grown that are, are easily differentiated at each growing season. So the answer is yes, but you need to, there are conditions. Okay, and then I suppose one of the, 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 the bigger questions, uh, and we have a lot of questions relating to the whole issue of markets and saturation of markets and the need to extend our market into Europe if we're really yep. going to expand. And uh, there's a half a dozen questions in relation to that. Yes, and that's true. That is very, it's a very good point. And I'm not going to say otherwise. Yes, markets need to, need to be developed for, there is one thing, for people to enter conversion, but they to enter organics, but they do need a market, and definitely work needs to be marked. It needs to be market driven, so work needs to be done by everybody as regards the stakeholders for marketing. Yes. A question there: Are there different standards across for organic production across countries, or have they been standardised uh, at Europe? There are. Yes, there are different. Well, no, what, how I would explain this without getting too tied up? There's a minimum set of standards that I said at the EU level. And then each country adapts those uh, those standards. So yes, there would be slight variation from country to country, but the minimum standard is the same right across. Uh, and again, I suppose a technical question, are there limits to the amount of organic manures and the types of organic manures that you can import onto your, onto your farm? Yes, uh, that is the short answer. Yes, there is. I presume the best way I exp- uh, to explain this is, Organic manures can be imported from outside the farm gate from non-organic sources, provided that the source from from which it's coming from is non-factory farming. So it's from non-zero grazing systems. So sometimes when I'm talking maybe in the cabin monitor, people would ask me, is pig slurry allowed? That would not be allowed because it's coming from a zero grazing system. And there is conditions when you take in the in the like porch litter from convention would be allowed. So those are the kind, and when you take them in, they have to be composted as well. But that's, cou- that's the answer. Okay. And a couple of, uh, no, no, it's great, uh, quite clear. A uh, couple of questions in, in relation to the, how the organic schemes fit with other agri-environmental schemes. Yeah, well, I'll give the comparison maybe to GLOSS that maybe p- people mm. are aware with. There, uh, there are certain, um, in relation to, there is a l- large number of farmers in both the GLOSS and the organic farming scheme, but there are options within the GLOSS scheme that you will only get the GLOSS payment for. So for example, low input permanent pasture or traditional hay meadows, they're an option in, their, in the GLOSS scheme. If you take those options in the GLOSS scheme, you will not get paid for them in the, the organic farming scheme because as you quite rightly said, it's an environmental scheme. Okay. But you so, can take other options that won't interfere with the land based scheme. That's but the two abroad. schemes, I think one of the questions was what do this do, are you allowed to be in the two schemes? Yes, you are allowed, but there's certain there's certain there's certain options that you if you take in glass, you won't get your organic farming scheme payment for. But most but you would be farming it from an organic certification point of view, you would be farming it all organically and you would be registering it all organically. In most cases. Uh, another quick bar one, is there a list of organic processors available? No. I mean, that is one thing, yes, that when you think about the sector, no, there isn't. It's by word of mouth. If somebody, we, we know the main, if I just 
say to you now, the main processes of organic beef in Ireland, the two main processors are Slaney Meats and Good in Wexford and a Good Herdsmen in um, Care in County Tipperary. And then the main processor of lamb would be Irish Country Meats in Camolin in Wexford. Okay. Um, of the farmers uh, that are, are farming organically, are there many who drop out of the system and what are the reasons that they tend to drop out? Well, it's kind of a, a negative question, but a kind a of... A negative question, but it's very a very positive question as well. Of, yeah. Um, from my experience, um, I think talking the... Just to give a fact, and then I'll give my opinion, the, a fact in the, the present organic farming scheme, like the glass scheme, ended in the end of December 2020 and under transitional arrangements um, organic farmers were given another year to extend their contract and I think there's in and around 1500 give or take uh, in, in the scheme and I think 98% responded and of the 98% that responded 98% uh, are staying in the scheme. So that's a fact, just to give you the factual on it. From my own opinion, from my own experience, I haven't come across it um, very often. Some people, it depends, the organic farming scheme payment is a structured per hectare payment. So the more hectares you have, the more payment that you get. Uh, and coupled with as I said, we have you all. You have to register with an organic certification body, and they're an annual fee every year. So maybe some people with a smaller hectare, when they when they add up what they're paying the certification and the scheme, they sometimes balance it out. Maybe no, they, they may not continue, and that's being that's being very honest about it. And then other people uh, maybe. Some people, uh, natural life, they're coming to an age where they're retiring and maybe the next person isn't taking it on. So that's my well, that's, experience. That's, that's, that's very positive. I mean, at least uh, the fact that they're not moving back out of it uh, is, a, a, a sign, or is a good sign. Um, yes. Another, another yes. quick one, uh, and uh, allows for you to maybe plug, uh, are uh, there organic training courses opening soon? And is, are there waiting lists for them? There is waiting lists, definitely. <laughs> and I'm going to make that sure because if you're registered, there won't be one tomorrow for any for anybody. Yeah, the way we've done it, as I said, before, prior to this, we did the course in the local centres one day a week over four weeks. But that's not the case with COVID. We've had to adapt via Zoom and online learning. So we're in the process of setting up those online courses. If they go back to the slide where I had the, the address, if you click in there, you will get details and information how to register for an online course and to be put on a waiting list. So you will be put on a waiting list. And when we have, I suppose, our ducks in a row and ready to deliver, uh, people will be notified of courses and then they'll be directed to how, how to go about registering for them. But we will be doing because with the scheme opening, uh, it is a requirement as part of the application. So we will be doing courses, yes. Lane, we've um, had a lot of uh, qu queries and questions there in relation to market access and uh, creating new markets. Is there advice uh, that you can give in, in terms of for, for, for farmers uh, or indeed uh, processors? How, how do we make those better connections? Um, and, and where can farmers go to find out uh, more information about potential uh, markets that are out there? Um, is, are there supports or people resources available in Board BIA for uh, the organic sector? Yeah, uh, what you're talking about, just to make sure I get a uh, mark, is if for somebody to find a market for their produce. Is it for an or for yeah. rather the big, you're talking about a, a primary producer as such? Yes. yes. What supports are out there? Um, I have to think, sorry now, to really think about this one. Really, because the sector is so small, and it's something actually that I've heard recently with, in conversation with a group of organic farmers, that there is no mark, you know, like in convention, you can look up market report and you can look up at the prices of beef. Never, there is nothing like that presently in, in the organic sector. So there's a lot of work to be done in relation to that. So I, I really say we nearly all need uh, a one 
common I heard is maybe some sort of a database maybe being set up where organic farmers can get in contact to getting uh, stock or getting feed or anything like that. It is there through the certification classified sections and all the rest, but even for people who are looking at the sector as an option, for them to find out information, they really need to talk to somebody that's farming organically as it is. So there needs to be, I suppose, what am I trying to say, um, tools put in place for farmers to access that information. It is there, but it is there, but it's just it's more difficult to, to access it. And I suppose that would be would be something that could certainly be, be improved. You can always improve that. I hope that yeah no that's 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 good and I know I, it can be probably frustrating yeah. well I, I and I particularly like that model that is adopted by the the little milk company you know that that farmer led organized producer group where you I have also seen it where you have different producers producing different uh, uh, vegetables or cereals and and they're actually marketing that under a single brand as as well and they have distribution and so forth you know there's there's some really innovative uh, yeah, uh, and it could be maybe maybe that's something from a rural development even policy something to be looked at like that producer groups or group funding help to help people to come together. There are models out there of people doing it, but I suppose people don't want to approach to approach people that are doing it already. It would be good if we yeah. A question here: uh, Do you prioritize the health of, of the soil and principles of regenerative agriculture in assessing and uh, uh, for certification, or in the advice that you give farmers? The, what I would say to you is yes. In organics, we when we are talking about organics and we're doing our training, uh, certainly giving training. Over overall, in organics, the starting point is your health, and you. Uh, it, there's an analogy used in organics, you feed the soil rather than feeding the plants. Certainly that is one of the underlying principles of organics. In relation to, again, the whole area of soil biology, as you know, and having previous speakers uh, and researchers on it, it's a whole new area that a lot of work is, is being done on at the moment. There's a whole lot of unknowns, but certainly you are looking at your soil. In relation to you were saying, Pat, as regards to conversion, is it? The, yeah, well, it's both in the conversion and in the, the general yeah, practice you would, and the advice you give. Certainly, your soil is your wealth, then it's your, it definitely is needs looking after, and you would be concentrating on, on, on that, certainly. And then in organics, you would be taking, uh, you know, as I said, an approach of feeding the soil to, to continue on the process. What, maybe we're, I think we're coming up close to the end, but there's a very fitting <laughs> question uh, uh, just to maybe to, to get near an end. Where can I get out more information on all of this? Uh, we have a ver our website. Again, if you go into it, we have a lot of information and we've done new fact sheets. We have vid videos of success stories of, of organic farming. So certainly our website is, is an area to go that we have a lot of information on it sign up on that waiting list for the organic course. And we, over that course, over that 25 hours, we go through all aspects of, of organic farming. The organic certification bodies that I mentioned there, there's a lot of information on their websites, the Department of Agriculture organic section information there, or B information there. So it's kind of grabbing all in, in, in those, in, 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 in that, in, in those um, areas. Uh, and I suppose a final comment, I don't think I've ever seen as many questions come in on, on these sessions, of all the sessions we've had, as there has been today. So apologies for, the, for those. Yeah, those who... quick fire ones weren't very quick fire. <laughs> <laughs> so apologies for those that we didn't manage no, to get to. I hope, uh, and, I hope, yeah. And what, what I do is we'll try and pass them on to, to Elaine and uh, with the possibility that maybe there'll be a bit of follow up on something. Certainly, if I can, to call and uh, hopefully I have... Uh, shared some information and made people a bit more aware of the whole sector. That's what I wanted to do this morning. Well, thank you very much for that, Elaine. A really good summary of, of where things stand in the organic sector. Huge potential is what I'm hearing. Uh, so uh, if anyone wants more information about uh, the courses, uh, go to chagas.ie forward slash organics or just put in Chagas Organics. I'm sure it'll bring you to it. Or indeed, the, uh, the uh, organic certification bodies also have good information there. So Elaine, thank you again for excellent presentation and a reminder to everybody that Elaine's presentation 
along with a recording of today's webinar, will be available on the Chagas website over the next number of days. Um, just uh, next week, we'll be speaking to uh, Dr. Sinead Waters uh, from Chagask uh, about development of strategies to reduce methane emissions from agriculture. So do join us next Friday, uh, the 29th for that. Um, if you'd like to receive updates on training opportunities, latest publications and events from Chagask, uh, I encourage you to sign up to the Chagask Connected program uh, for free. Uh, you can do that by just clicking on going to chagask.ie forward slash connected. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank our production team, uh, in particular, Andy Boland, uh, Catherine Keena, Pat Murphy, Yvonne Maher. So from all of the team, take care and stay safe. And thanks for watching. Bye bye, everybody.